All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tyler Welsh, and I'm excited to have everybody joining us for today's webinar, uh, another version of CMU Connect. Uh, today's title is Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace. Uh, very excited for this one and excited to continue our CMU Connect webinars. Uh, before we get started, I do want to go over just kind of a couple logistical notes. As always, I do apologize in advance during technical difficulties. Knock on wood, hoping that we don't have any. But if you do, yep, thank you, Phil. <laughs> we do encourage you to go to uh, support.zoom.us. Uh, also, you will see that there's a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we encourage you and we hope that you will ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, we want this to be interactive. So feel free to drop your questions at any time, even while Phil's still presenting. Uh, you're encouraged to drop them then. Uh, we also do want to say that we have also physical copies and digital copies of Phil's new book, Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace. So those of you that participate, ask some questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we will be giving off 10 of these books, both uh, physical, the paperback, and the digital version. So if you participate, uh, hopefully you can get a copy of it too. Um, but at this time, uh, enough of me. I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Phil Simon, who is an alumnus from the class of 1994. Uh, he's a frequent keynote speaker, recognized collaboration and technology authority, and college professor for hire. Uh, he's done many great things. We're excited to have Phil here today. He also hosts his own podcast. Uh, he's the award-winning author of many books. But with that being said, I'll give some uh, virtual jazz hands and welcome today's speaker. How's it going today, Phil? Hey, Tyler, thanks for having me. Is it okay if I start to share my screen? All right, stage is yours. Great. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Again, my name is Phil Simon. And I went to Carnegie Mellon a million years ago. And today I'm going to talk about my most recent book, Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace. Let's light this candle. Um, Oh, here's my plan of attack for today. I'd probably go for about 30, 32 minutes, give or take, depending on how much I rant. But the goal is to provide a, a lot of time for individual questions and to make it as interactive as possible. Plus, there are a few polls. So I'll do an intro, which I've done. We'll talk a little bit about the world of work. Where are we now? We're in a very different place than we were three years ago for obvious reasons. I'd like to review some data and try to make some predictions about the future. I'll then get into the crux of the new book, uh, project management, and specifically the problems that hybrid and remote work pose. And then since I'm not just about pointing out problems, I'm going to mention some solutions. And as I said, there'll be plenty of time for some q and A. I'm a big fan of quotes. I've done these before. Today's quote is from Cyril Northcote Perkinson, a British naval author and historian. And he famously said, that work will expand to fill the time allotted for its completion. That is also known as Parkinson's law. It's one of my faves. In a nutshell, if you think that it's gonna take four months to do something, it's going to take four months, but if you had said three or five, you would have been right as well. So world of work, where are we now? Well, the pandemic is basically the new normal and it's going to ebb and flow. I, I don't see how it goes away. In fact, I think it's um, now technically an endemic, not a pandemic. So if we've learned anything, it's that we have been productive um, working in a remote or a hybrid capacity and workers do not wanna give that up. Here's some research from the Slack Future Forum that three and four workers would like to have control over where they work. Now, that's interesting. Um, I would have thought it would have been higher. But to me, the more interesting stat is that almost 95% of people want control over when they work. And that makes sense, right? The Monday through Friday, nine to five workday is, is a construct, right? Where is that written? Why couldn't you work in multiple shifts? Why couldn't you take a nap during lunch or go for a walk or shoot basketball or golf or take care of a loved one, pick your kid up from soccer practice? So we don't want to give up this newfound flexibility. And then again, the data absolutely reflects this. Um, employers want, as the pandemic uh, proceeded, more and more time to work remotely or from home. And employers started to respond. Again, here's some data. This is from right before the book went to publication. But the trend may be small, but it's certainly consistent. Employers are responding. And that varies according to industry and a number of other variables. But 
it's not something that workers want to give up. And one of my theses in the new book is that the longer this goes on, the less likely we are willing to give this up. If the pandemic had been two weeks, it had been a snow day, all right, time to go back to work. But we now have had over two years of working in a hybrid or remote capacity We'll quit our jobs. In fact, I was looking at some Wall Street Journal article the other day about how workers may want to give up three to five percent of their wages if it means working in a remote or hybrid capacity. So workers are choosing not to return to the office. And that number, again, increased during the pandemic. It was 36 percent in 2020, October. And now, last time I checked, it is 61 percent of people who are choosing not to return. And this begs the question, why? Right. Well, personal choice is a biggie, and these are not exclusive, so they may over um, overlap to some extent. You don't just get to pick one. Some of us are fear of getting infected with COVID. Now, maybe that's dropping a little bit, as the data suggests, and people have become vaccinated, and there are drugs out there to help us get better. Um, many of us have children, and it's just easier to take care of them at home versus coordinating childcare, depending on where you live. I've got friends who pay, in some cases, two thousand dollars a month for childcare. Well, you don't have to spend as much if you're home some of the time. And in many instances, people have moved away from the office, right? If people are no longer tethered to an individual community, then in theory, they can work anywhere. Speaking of the office, um, I would argue that it's not simply a matter of people hate going to the office. Um, it's the commute. And this is a point that Dror Pollig made. He's a very intelligent uh, consultant and author, and he writes a lot about real estate and the future of work. So it is very much that we hate the commute. Uh, I want to say that pre-pandemic, the average American commute was 35 minutes each way. So if you take that as a given and you only have to commute three days a week, then in theory, you could save four hours, uh, not to mention the time uh, getting your face on or, or doing whatever you do to go to work. And again, the data absolutely indicates that this is the case. In New York City, for example, we're finding that people are using the subways more on weekends. So it's not that we don't want to travel or get out of our homes. It's that we don't want to go to the office all the time, primarily because of the commute. So I thought this was an interesting stat. And this begs the question, what are we looking at here, right? How, what is the ideal number of days that someone would want to spend in an office? So here's some more data from WFH Research. Um, there is a cohort of people, roughly one in five, who never or rarely want to go. But then things are kind of bimodal beyond that, right? We've got a, a smidgen here, one to two, but it looks like the most common uh, answers here are either never or all the time. Um, so there is this sweet spot for organizations. And again, this is global. This does not reflect an individual industry. And there are all sorts of ways to cut the data. So for instance, if you live in a city, uh, you might have more flexibility about working from home than if you work in a small town and that's just not discouraged, not to mention industry. Tech workers are much more capable, I would argue, of working remotely than let's say you're doing physical security or, or certainly something like manufacturing. So um, it's, it's really interesting to see how things have evolved over time. And I'm curious, um, Tyler, if you wanna shoot up the first poll here, I wanted to make this interactive. So how many days a week do you currently go to your employer's office? Wow, lots of zeros. Interesting. Wow. Okay, the five days a week thing doesn't surprise me so much, but... Okay. Okay, we can probably close this, uh, Tyler. But interesting. Um, Roughly one in two, zero days. Okay, I can stop sharing it, right? Okay. Okay. Interesting data here. One in five go zero, uh, but then it's fairly evenly spread throughout. Okay, let's close this and get back to it. All right, so we're going into the office, but um, maybe less frequently, depending on your job, maybe not at all, but are employees more engaged? Well, I'd argue that they've never been all that engaged, even pre-COVID, and I'm a big fan of pop culture references. Some of you are going to recognize this one, but employees have never been all that engaged while on the clock before COVID and possibly after. But again, don't believe me. One of my favorite quotes is from 
the total quality management expert, W. Edwards Deming, in God We Trust, All Others Must Bring Data. This is some data from Gallup. It reflects American workers, but researching the book, I discovered that there were similarities with other industrialized countries, uh, such as England and the, and the UK. But employees really kind of maxed out at around 40% um, of being actively engaged. Interestingly, during the pandemic, there was this uptick, and one could argue that it's because maybe we had more control over our lives. We were working from home. Sure, it was stressful during the pandemic. Many people got laid off early on, although they have found jobs and the labor market is historically tight in the US, I believe it's 3%, but we've never been all that engaged. So you could argue that, yeah, COVID-19 was a crisis, um, but there is opportunity in crisis. So kind of taking a step back there as we hopefully move to a different phase and people can deal or, and manage COVID and not have to shut things down to the same extent as before. I'd argue that pre-COVID, our work lives were at the center and our personal lives revolved around that. Well, now that we've had some time to adjust, um, many of us want to continue to have our work lives revolve around our personal lives. Okay. Uh, but there's still plenty of tension around remote and hybrid work, right? There isn't necessarily a playbook for this. And I think the poster boy for contemporary controversy on a number of levels is, you guessed it, this guy, Elon Musk. And we could talk for him about him for hours and hours, but um, apropos to this discussion, not that long ago, he declared an end of remote work to uh, Tesla employees. And if you didn't have a choice on Friday, if that's when the announcement um, came out, then of course on Monday you'd go, but I bet you there were a lot of people who started looking for jobs. In fact, on a LinkedIn group that I was a part of, I saw a poll and that was the general consensus. Some um, people will quit if they're forced to return to the office. Or as I'm happy to say, office mandates aren't going to work even if they're from petulant billionaires. Um, it may work in an individual case or in the short term, but we don't wanna give up this flexibility. Again, though, there isn't necessarily a playbook for hybrid work. Um, how does it shake out, right? What are the rules in a company for one department or one manager versus another, right? I would argue that certain positions are more capable of being performed in a remote capacity. If you, for example, process insurance claims or process payroll or take call center, um, uh, work in a call center, taking calls from customers, you can pretty much do that anywhere. But project work, tends to be more challenging. And in fact, it always has been because there are things that we need to decide in a group in a synchronous fashion. We want to trust our colleagues who are forcing us to change our business or maybe implement a new system. Uh, my first book, Why New Systems Fail, is all about botched enterprise resource planning and customer relationship management implementation. So projects were always very difficult, but again, don't believe me, let's look at data. According to the PMI Project Management Institute, Companies were successful maybe three times out of five, and they only got that kicker when they followed what PMI would call their talent triangle. Long story short, they followed best practices. They did what they should. But many times organizations either missed their budget, missed their deadline, or did not deliver the functionality or the system with the intended scope. So and, and I've seen instances in which all these things have taken place. So it's pretty much better than a coin flip, maybe a little bit, which brings me to my next question. Tyler, if you would, I'm curious about what you think of project management with um, remote and hybrid work. So which ones are harder, which ones are easier? Interesting. It's like we're getting some pretty good participation on these polls. Yeah, it's almost everybody that uh, just completed it. Okay, we'll give another few seconds, but. Okay. So equally challenging wins 56% 50, of the time. So I was curious about that because when I was researching the book, again, I'm a big data guy. I went to Carnegie Mellon and I don't know if that's still true, Tyler, but when I was there, they said even the poets know how to code. So I appreciate data and technology. So I ran a poll on LinkedIn in a group of which I'm a member 
And I asked basically the same question, right? Which ones are harder, physical or remote projects or hybrid ones? And here were the results. Um, about the same was 47%. The order is a little bit different, but the data is pretty consistent here. Um, there are actually some folks, I thought this was interesting, who thought that hybrid and remote projects were easier to manage. Now that's abstract, which begs the question, do you have any specific examples? And of course I do. So for some, I specifically want to pick pre-pandemic because I would argue that if we tapped our colleagues on the shoulder to ask a question, they could answer it in real time, right? It's not as easy to do if you're working in a remote or hybrid capacity because your colleague could be um, really anywhere at any time. So we're gonna go back to the year 2016. And some of you may remember that popular movies were Finding Dory, and I can't believe this one's this old, Star Wars Rogue One. And I wanna talk about a little car rental company called Hertz. And Hertz management decided that its website and its mobile app needed to be um, rewritten from scratch. And they had a pretty big budget for it, around $32 million. Now, equipped with no other information, in 2016, you would think that that would be more than enough to build a kick-ass website and mobile app, right? I mean, the iPhone dropped in 2007, so it's not like they were building an app in 2008. We had almost a decade of apps, and certainly websites have been around for a lot longer than that. To boot, they hired the Hertz executives Accenture. Now, in terms of brand recognition and cachet, it's hard to imagine a worse choice, right? The, the maxim, no one ever got fired for, hire, for hiring IBM is still uh, very much alive and well. So with no other information, you think that that project would go well, right? But I wouldn't be talking about it if it did, right? As it turned out that um, this project wound up like a lot of these system implementations and new technology projects do in court. Uh, one thing led to another. I don't know who's to blame. I don't want to get sued, but I do know that the parties did not build the system and the uh, the website and the app that they promised, and they wound up in court with lawyers, which if I work for Accenture or Hertz, I don't want to have happen, but clearly something dropped the ball. If you want to read the article, uh, included the URL at the top here. So again, this is a project in 2016. We didn't have to worry about COVID. In theory, we could still work remote, but it wasn't uncommon to be on site four or five days as a consultant. I've never worked for Accenture, but I've spent plenty of time working as a consultant, and it wasn't uncommon to be on site four days a week. So that's a big company, $32 million Hertz and Accenture, right? What if it's a smaller project? And in my new book, I detail an example of a project that actually... Um, I replaced the names with characters from the TV show Succession. Um, you either love that show or you hate it. All the characters are despicable. It's on HBO. I love it. But I, again, didn't want to get sued. And um, long story short, a company hired a bunch of people to build a prototype of a website. And the team built the website. In fact, they delivered twice as much functionality as the contract called for. I'm simplifying here. There's a lot more detail in the book. They came in 40% under budget. Now, with the statistics I just gave you before from PMI, you realize that that doesn't happen very often. And the client was absolutely ecstatic with the results. They wanted to bring the team on for phase two and phase three. Unfortunately, all hell broke loose. I'll cut to the chase. There were some people involved in that project who forget considering it a success, considered it a failure. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. But the people who objected most to the project's outcome, which again, the client really liked, weren't involved. They were hybrid, even though they were local and the client actually flew cross country from Washington DC to the West Coast to participate in. So um, this begs the question, why? What are some of the challenges on remote or hybrid projects? Why can they be more problematic than their synchronous um, in-person counterparts. Now, to be fair, just because you're meeting in person and just because you're meeting um, at the same time doesn't mean that things always go well, right? The Accenture and the Hertz example showed that. But I would argue in the book that there are reasons. So things are asynchronous, right? I can't just tap Tyler on the shoulder and say, hey, Tyler, you got a minute here. I didn't understand what you said in the meeting, right? We have to sync up with people. We have to get on their calendar. We send them an email or a message in Microsoft Teams or Slack, or we use a Calendly link to schedule time with them. So there are all sorts of logistical challenges. If companies are going to downsize their uh, real estate footprint and save money, which a lot of them are doing, 
where do we meet? Do we have the space board? What if everybody comes in on the same day? How do we coordinate all that? Also tech troubles. So before the podcast, Tyler and I were speaking about companies that use too many tools. And I've seen this happen. In fact, my previous book, and I did a webinar for it, I don't know, a year and a half ago, maybe for Carnegie Mellon. You can watch it on my website, hashtag Sameless Plug. I want to use my, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to use my tool, right? I use Slack. I'm comfortable with Slack, but we don't use that, right? We want to use Microsoft Teams. Well, who wins, right? Or we use WebEx and we use Skype or we use Zoom. So we, we many times don't want to use our new tools. I just introduced Tyler to Notion and he really likes it. But if an organization uses Smartsheet, you know, what if IT bans other tools like Notion? And then there are plain old human factors. And this takes me back to my Carnegie Mellon days, taking some psychology classes. Lots of reasons that we as human beings contribute to the problem, right? And, and argue that these hybrid and remote environments can introduce new cognitive biases and exacerbate existing ones. Which cognitive biases? Well, for that, we're going to go to Mr. Dan Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner, wrote an excellent book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Fun fact, the only time in my life that I've ever met a Nobel Prize winner in 2011 in Washington, D.C., I was speaking at an event, and he was too. And I consider myself a reasonably smart cookie, but to paraphrase John F. Kennedy, um, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I was not in the wrong room there. Absolutely brilliant. Let's start off with optimism. Optimism bias, right? So we expect on these projects that things are going to go really well. And this is true, generally speaking, whether it's hybrid or remote. When in reality, there are a lot more issues that get in the way. But go back to what I said before for a minute, right? We like working from home or working from anywhere. Fun fact, Airbnb isn't trying to brand itself as a vacation company, but as a living company. So forget a vacation. I want to live in Denmark for six months and still keep my job. So we want these things to work out. We don't want to give up the flexibility that we fought so long to achieve. So we've got optimism bias. Uh, next up, we've got the halo effect. Um, and just before I get into work, we attribute or ascribe qualities to people whom we like. So I like Tyler. He's young. He's open to new technology. He went to Carnegie Mellon. We were talking about Buffalo. I went to grad school in Ithaca, New York at Cornell University. So we have in common. I like him. So I'm going to assume He's got other qualities, right? So if he's handsome and sure, Tyler, go for it. I assume that you're fun and you're smart and you're friendly, right? What does this have to do with remote or hybrid work? Well, if I only meet someone over Zoom, and if you see the background, it, I know I'm showing the slides now, but I typically have a, a Breaking Bad poster in the background. Uh, fun fact, I actually just met Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul in San Francisco about six weeks ago. Uh, that did not suck. They're, they're actors of, from my favorite show, got some autographs, some pictures, whatever. So if I see someone with a Breaking Bad picture, I go, that's my favorite show. So of course, I'm going to like that person. I may not observe that person in real time in an office and go, well, even though you like Breaking Bad, dude, your work isn't very good or you don't show up on time. So I'm more likely to give that person the benefit of the doubt. But there's also arguably the elephant in the room, and that is proximity bias, basically out of sight, out of mind. Um, I, if I see Tyler in the office five days a week, I go, wow, Tyler, you're working really hard. And if no one ever sees me, they go, what, what does Phil do all day, right? We never see him. That is such a big problem that, again, going back to the Future Forum, um, uh, roughly two in five executives cite it as their top concern, right? How do we manage people effectively? How can we gauge their performance if we don't see them, right? How do we prevent their from becoming a caste system or two-tier system? So people who show up in the office, we treat in a fundamentally different and unfair way than people who are working remotely. So these are just some of the problems that I cover in the book, and I want to move now on to solutions. Right? There are a lot of um, inherent obstacles associated with remote work. And I thought that I could point out the issues, but what good is a book that doesn't prescribe some solutions? So here are five of them. Five, if you like, um, if you're a golfer, clubs in the bag. And first up, I'm a big believer in probabilistic thinking. I am not guaranteeing that if you follow these five things or the other things that I mentioned in the book, that your project will be successful. But kind of like playing blackjack, if the dealer is showing a six and you've got 15, hold, let the dealer bust. Sometimes you'll lose, but that is the statistically correct way to play the game. And if you play otherwise, and I've seen it happen at casinos, I used to live in Vegas. So if you don't go once a, a month, I revoke your citizenship. I'm kidding. Um, but 
if you don't play the game correctly, other people will leave because you're going to screw it up for everyone else. So think about what I'm saying as odds to in, uh, ways to increase your odds of success. So let's start off with Brian Elliott. He is the head of that um, research think tank that I mentioned before, the Future Forum, part of Slack, which is now, of course, part of Salesforce. And he and his co-founders recently wrote a book called How the Future Works. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot to unpack in that book. It's got a ton of data, some of which I cite in my own uh, most recent books. But one thing that I want to point out is this notion of a team level agreement. That is, if we work together on a project, particularly for the first time, we need to establish what tools we're going to use, when we're going to meet, what is our process for things. Because if we've got different people using their own tech or not abiding by these processes, again, we can't tap people on the shoulder. Right. Some people may work seven to two, right? They're morning people. Some people are night owls. And if we don't establish team norms, I can pretty much guarantee that your project isn't going to be successful. Ditto for when everyone uses their own technology. Well, I use Smartsheet, I use Airtable, I use Slack, I use Teams. Well, okay, but you're not using a collaboration or product or a project management tool by yourself. Right. So if you want to use on your phone to do it which is what I use for task management. It's basically the remote control for my life to remind me to take the garbage out for or the recycling out every week. That's my personal choice. But if I'm working on a team and the team's using Asana, but I use Google Sheets or I use Trello, that's going to be a problem. And this importance of tools at the risk of plugging myself too much, I cover in a much more depth than the previous book. But this idea that Slack is just email 2.0 or Microsoft Teams um, could not be more untrue. Next up, again, I'm a big pop culture reference, this notion of pilots, right? Seinfeld did not do well in its early uh, incarnation rating wise, um, but there was enough there that one of the executives for NBC said, these guys have something here, let's kind of roll with it. So can we build some type of prototype before, go back to that Hertz project for a second, before spending $32 million, what if they had just built a small website or an app with limited functionality, right? Maybe it only lets you book a car and it's in private beta on an iPhone before rolling it out everywhere else. Uh, there's a ton to unpack here, but um, the, many of the factors include, for example, if you've got a, a large project or a complex project, right? You know, need for the pilot. Right? We don't really need one too much, but if it's a much more um, complex project, we absolutely need to do a pilot. Ditto for a complexity. If it's simple, yeah, you know what? It's a simple website. I can bang that out in a day uh, versus something that's incredibly complicated like an Amazon or an eBay. You don't really build that from scratch. Uh, this is why a lot of software developers rely upon agile methods like Scrum. Also, is this a mature product? Again, if you're building a website and you're using WordPress, I'll come back to that in a minute. WordPress runs 43% of the web last time I checked. Right, so it's established, right? Maybe we don't need a pilot, but if you're using something that's cutting edge, it makes sense to sort of dip your toe in the water or date before you get married. And next up, it's a big organization, right? It's not hard to imagine some political considerations or some conflicts there versus if it's a small organization, right? It's a six person law firm. You can pretty much talk to the decision maker. You're not gonna have a lot of competing interests or bureaucracy. Right. Is it an essential project? Right. Well, if it is, then you may want to make sure that it works from the get go versus if it's something that's kind of nice to have in one corner of the organization. And if the project fails, all right, well, we can take the hit. Um, are the team members new? Right. If I've worked with Tyler for the last 15 years and we know each other's rhythms, okay, you know, we're, we're good to go. But what if it's a new team? Like again, going back to Hertz and Accenture, those are people who probably didn't work with each other too much before. Uh, methodology, if you're using an agile approach, again, like Scrum, then you would absolutely use a pilot. That's a key part of it versus a waterfall method, in which case you would use um, basically release the whole thing at an end. So if I'm launching a drug or an airplane that needs to work right at the beginning, but if I'm Netflix and I want people to download movies, if they're on a plane beforehand, right, so they can watch them with poor Wi-Fi, you don't necessarily need to launch that on every device at once. And then finally, it's primarily an in-person workplace. You probably don't need a pilot as much as if it's hybrid or remote. So once you understand some of those variables, you return to Hertz and Accenture and you realize how insane it was for them to try to boil the ocean, whether they were working remotely or not. And it isn't surprising to me uh, that the company experienced some problems when I told a friend of mine 
who's got a ton of experience with enterprise systems as well, that the company spent $32 million. Uh, he said, oh, is that all? Because uh, we've both seen projects like, say, Hershey's with SAP back in 1998 that were a lot more expensive than that. So again, going back to optimism bias for a moment, depending on some of the factors that I just mentioned, how can we overcome them, right? Well, what if Hertz and Accenture had done a pre-mortem? We all know what a post-mortem is, right? What happened after the fact? The project broke bag, bad, excuse me. Uh, people did not cooperate. We couldn't agree on requirements and technologies and tools and processes and you know little things like that. Well, what if we assume that everything went wrong? What if we use it in the past voice, pe um, past tense, excuse me, right? Knowing that it failed, what could we have done to do that? If that cost hurts an Accenture, say $300,000, yeah, that's a lot of money. But on top of $32 million, it's a rounding error. Next up, if we're working asynchronously and we're sending a lot of text messages and data from Microsoft indicates that I want to say during the pandemic that something like um, the number of messages sent in Teams went up by 62% because we were working asynchronously. What if people actually wrote well, right? Writing workshops, if you think that's insane, this man would disagree. This is Bill Carr. He used to work with a little guy by the name of Jeff Bezos. He was on his S team at Amazon and he wrote a really good book. Bill was on my podcast. Here's the link if you want to listen to it. And the book is called Working Backwards. So at Amazon, they value clear writing. Some of you may know that the company famously issues PowerPoint presentations. If you go in with a deck like this one at Amazon, you'll get kicked out of the room. Instead, employees there write at most six page memos that executives read, I kid you not, in silence in a room and then ask thoughtful questions. And there are all sorts of rules around these six pagers. But the bottom line is that at Amazon, if you can't write and communicate clearly with the written word, you're not going to go very far. So the company invests in writing workshops for employees, especially senior execs, and they're not alone. Automatic, the company I mentioned before, behind WordPress, which runs 43% of the web, also does the same things. In fact, a friend of mine, Josh Burnoff, does writing workshops for companies, and they be they go over very well. So these are just a few of the suggestions from the book. I promised to go for about a half an hour to add, take some questions, but if you want to find out about me, Here's where you can learn about all my nonsense. I want to thank you for your time. And I think we've got one more poll about whether this was valuable, uh, Tyler. Yeah, sounds good. We just launched the poll. Um, feel free to fill it out now. You can do it later on too, because we are going to enter the Q&A portion of this segment too. Uh, so maybe you'll find things a little more valuable after your questions have been answered too. Uh, that being said, uh, Phil is leaving us with about a half hour of q and I see that we do have a handful of questions um, already lined up um, in the Q&A box. Remember to keep asking your questions, um, and then we will select a random 10 people who uh, do ask a question uh, to receive a copy of Phil's book. Again, we do have the physical copies as well as the digital copies too. Uh, but that being said, won't waste any more time since we do have some questions coming in already. Um, and again, feel free to type yours in as they come in too. Um, so that being said, we will start with, uh, I hope I pronounced your name correct, uh, er, Erlender. Uh, his que or their question is, could hybrid work, could hybrid work better if there are also core hours set for collaboration? 100%. In fact, that's actually one of the recommendations in the book that I didn't mention. Plenty of companies establish you know, eight to 12 Pacific time is a, is a set of core hours. So 100%, the idea that all work can take place asynchronously is absurd. Um, so it, that is a great observation and, and one that I actually point out in the book. A lot of companies have adopted that. Good call. Uh, next question is from Kirby. Uh, are there any metrics that talk about how efficient, effective it is to work in hybrid versus in person? Universally, none to my knowledge. Um, I, I get a little queasy here when I hear questions like this, because you, if you only have a hammer, right, everything's a nail. So, you know, it, could someone be as effective in six hours as someone else at eight? Sure. I'd hate to see effectiveness on a gauge of number of minutes spent in front of a screen or number of messages sent in Teams or Microsoft Slack. Conversely, and, and tools like Slack have this capability built in. I'm sure that Microsoft Teams and Google Workspace have similar uh, features. I use this with my students. So I'm a former college professor and I use Slack in the classroom and I could see 
not necessarily which student because of privacy concerns um, or which messages they sent if they were private, but I could see if people weren't involved in Slack, they could have been using another tool. But if no one is checking into your tool, so let's say Tyler hasn't logged into Slack for two weeks, um, is he being productive? Perhaps he's doing some deep work to coin the phrase from, from Cal Newport, but I'm unaware of them. I mean, if you've got a tool like um, Asana or, um, gosh, uh, Smartsheet or uh, Trello, is it possible to ascertain the number of tasks completed on time and break that down by department or role or even person? Sure. And could you put in a field for whether it was completed in person or remotely? But I always come back to, oh, I forget the name of it, um, Good Goodhart's Law. Uh, there you go. Once people know how they're being engaged, they'll game the system for it. So back in my um, consulting days, I worked with one company and they implemented a CRM, but they never defined what a sale was. Their best proxy was number of customer, quote unquote, touch points. I hated that word, but that's what they used. Well, it didn't take people long to realize that if I said, Tyler, did you get that email? Yes. You sure you got it? Yes. 100% yes. People were kind of gaming the system. So just be careful if you go down that road because it road is that people understand um, that that's how they're being managed and potentially compensated, then they will skew their behaviors towards doing that. Awesome, thanks, Bill. Uh, before we get to the next question, um, I do wanna remind everybody that yes, this is being recorded. Uh, there'll be a follow-up email that goes out uh, sometime early next week that will have the recording to it. Um, so you will be able to um, re-watch it as well as share with any friends, colleagues, other alumni as well. Um, before we get into the next question, I will drop um, in the chat that's Phil's website. Uh, a couple of people have kind of been questioning about your book as well as like other books too. So um, all of Phil's previous work as well as resources, as well as connection can be found in that website. Um, I'm also happy to, happy to connect on LinkedIn as well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, before we get to our next question, we do have something from Allison. Just wondering if you could just rehash the, the five suggestions real quick, Phil. Off the top of my head, uh, let's see if I can go from memory. The coffee's kicked in. <laughs> yeah. uh, the pilots, postmortems, writing seminars, agreeing on the tools and team level agreements. Boom! From memory. Nice, <laughs> nice. He knows his stuff. All right. This next like question. I wrote the book on it or something. Nice. <laughs> Next question is from Ian. Uh, this one I think is very interesting. Um, when thinking about remote versus on-site projects, is it possible that in-person interactions can sometimes be dominated by big personalities? So for example, physically imposing, conversationally imposing, um, where areas where it's less prevalent in remote meetings. So their comment is it can be harder for a single person to dominate the discussion um, in like a remote case. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, and it's a great question, Ian. First of all, plenty of companies recognize that proximity bias, and when it is a hybrid meeting, I've heard of, uh, I think it's Google, they insist that if one person dials in, everyone dials in, even if you're in person, and that, quite frankly, pisses off some people. Thinking, Wait a minute, I, I commuted here. You're making me call in via Zoom or Google Workspace or whatever they're using, so yeah, um, I know that Slack has done some interesting research about how these channels and workspaces and asynchronous tools can actually level the playing field because you are just one person with an avatar. Now, of course, you might know that it's the CEO and that person's um, comments carry more uh, gravitas than someone else's, but it is one of those tricky problems. But yeah, in theory, if it's just everyone having the same voice, um, it's harder for that one person to dominate. But um, again, if you fix on one end, it's kind of a balloon. You squeeze here and it, it pops up over there. So I, I don't have all the solutions, but I can see how someone's ticked off. They came in you know, a, a, an hour and a half commute or, or flew in and they have to do it all via Zoom anyway. Well, why don't I just do this from home? That, that's a great point. Awesome. Moving on to our next question. I see we have 38 of them still. In the I know, room. right? We, we may not get to them all, but again, we're happy to answer them offline. You can connect with Phil. Uh, Moving on to Cindy's question, uh, as a project manager, do you have any advice on how to onboard new hires and have them feel part of the hybrid project team? Um, yeah, our small company relies on investing in these individuals. Um, it's disappointing when they move on to other opportunities. So, yeah. to onboard new hires. That's another great question. Last week, I did a Q&A, not unlike this one we're doing now, 
with a small company that does data visualization. And they get people together uh, twice a year in different places, company, all hands on deck. Um, I think if you're attempting to build a relationship with someone, um, you want that in-person connection, you, you know, even if it means the expense of flying that person in uh, and meeting their teammates, because I know that if I have no connection to my employees, and I think the data bears this out, and I get an offer for 10% more, okay, great, I can do that. I'm not really missing anything. So building those connections, even if it's you know relatively expensive, I would argue is, is certainly worth it. Um, uh, beyond that, I, uh, I think it is essential to use the proper tools. So I know that if I started a job and immediately get deluged with 72 emails, I'm annoyed, right? Why isn't there a wiki? That's why I like a tool like Notion or Code is another tool. Or there's a Slack channel and I could at my own leisure review the history of the conversations in marketing or customer service or whatever my role is. Um, there, I had someone on my podcast, Lizzie Lawrence from Protocol, she's a journalist, and she's done a lot of interesting work, some of which I cite in the new book. And there's this great story of hers in which um, someone quit a company and was going to join a new one. And the new company used Microsoft Teams and the person thought about it over the weekend and said, I, I just can't do that. I'm a Slack person. So um, one of the points I make in the book is that we can in some way judge companies and their cultures by the tools that they use. I use the example of this one SEO company in the UK and I was very impressed with their website when I was looking at possibly using them for my own search engine optimization purposes. Long story short, right on their website, they have, we use Trello and we use Slack and we use Zoom. And I say, these are my kind of folks. If it were only folks that used email attachments and pretended that it's 1995, um, it's harder to build that trust with folks and really, I think, distinguish yourselves uh, from other people. So uh, a little bit of low tech meeting people and a little bit of high tech using new tools. All right, great, thanks. Uh, moving on to Anna's question. Any suggestions for the use of, use the same technology piece when you work in an organization that uses many options? So referring to, I believe what we talked about earlier, um, going back to just uh, use the same technology. Yeah, it's not a democracy, right? I mean, I hate to be so blunt about it when people say, I'm gonna use Google Sheets to track my participate in the pro participation in the project. You are affecting other people. Now look, everyone makes a mistake. Oh, I didn't realize we used Slack or Microsoft Teams for that. I sent an email, but uh, I'm a big believer that that should be something you should vet for when you hire people, right? So if you say we do our recruiting process through Slack or Microsoft Teams, we're gonna set you up with a guest account and they just say from the beginning, yeah, I don't use those tools that belies their statements during their interview process that say, sure, I'm really collaborative. Well, you won't use our tools. So that's a, an interesting data point. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that it starts from the top and you could argue that the fish stinks from the head down. So if the VP or CEO doesn't use these tools, it's really tough to tell people down the food chain, right? That they have to as well, because we all know where the conversation is going to go. I've met executives say, yeah, I just don't do collaboration hubs, Slack, Zoom, you know, workplace by Facebook, whatever. All right, so now you're gonna bifurcate the conversation. In the, in the book, I quote some interesting data from Asana about how they did a study and it was something like 39% of the time people said that they were working on work. In other words, scheduling, finding documents, trying to track stuff down, that stuff sucks, right? And I'd argue that it's a reason that we're fried. I mean, I enjoy writing, I enjoy creating, I enjoy strategizing, right? That's what I do. I despise sending emails back and forth about scheduling. That's why I use a tool like Calendly. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I cover it more in the previous book, but ultimately it's a change management issue. And if some people aren't going to get on board with it, you have to decide if they really should continue to work there because they will make life difficult for other people. One of my current clients hired me because he had spent four hours revising the old version of a document. And when he finally found out that it was the wrong one, he said, this is insane. We need to bring you in and apply some rigor because our company is relatively small. As we grow, it's only going to get harder. So I, I would not poo-poo someone, oh, that's just Tyler. He uses email. Um, I, I'd argue that's a dangerous mindset. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Um, keep on going over here. Um, so our next question we have from Pat C., would you say the success of a project being full remote, hybrid, or in-person depend on the characteristics of a project? So, for example, like small versus large complexity. 
yeah, so I'm researching this book. I said, hmm, let me do a quick search on Amazon. How many other books are out there on project management? In fact, it's one of the things my agent had discussed. So you realize this is um, what they would call a red ocean, not a blue one. And there were something like 30,000 books written before COVID on project management. So yeah, I mean, the size of the organization, but the composition of the people, some of those things that I mentioned before when the webinar goes live, uh, you'll see that table that I presented. Uh, but projects are multifaceted or multidisciplinary in nature. Um, you can have a great team with a well-defined scope, but a difficult project or external factors. Um, some of the books on project management, I kid you not, are 1,200 pages long. Uh, mine's only 350, and, and I like to think that it's an interesting read. By the way, Tyler, this is your cue to say, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's so many things that can go wrong. That's why I'm very deliberate in the book and saying, again, look, you can follow all of my advice and your project still fails and you can ignore it and it still succeeds. But there's a big difference between necessary and sufficient. So I like to think that a functional team is kind of a high um, hygiene factor. In other words, having one will certainly help. Um, but just because you have one doesn't mean that everything else falls into place, if that makes sense, right? You could have the in, um, inaccurate resources or an insufficient budget. I mean, there's so many things. And again, it Project is a big category. In the book, I break them into three buckets. We've got creating something. So I'm creating a website. It could be swapping things out, right? So we're getting rid of the old CRM or ERP system and putting in a new one. Or it could be retiring something, right? We need to sunset this application. Or in the real or physical world, we need to demolish this building, right? So there are lots of different types of projects, uh, but hopefully the book walks through things in a logical fashion. But uh, no, I'm not smart enough to say if you always have this, right, then it'll happen. Uh, to quote the um, immortal Bart Simpson, one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons, uh, he's running for student council president and um, he's, he's going up against Martin Prince, who's kind of the, um, you know, the, the smart guy, the egghead, whatever. And he says, my opponent says there are no easy answers. I say, he's not looking hard enough. I, I love that quote. Um, there, there isn't an easy answer. Okay, cool. Next question is from Aaron. Um, hey, Aaron. Aaron was actually in one of my classes. Um, speaking of hybrid, we never actually met in person, but uh, good to see or hear from you, Aaron. Um, anyways, Aaron's question is, have you found any correlation between, between whether people are extroverted versus introverted and their preference to work in person? I personally have it. I'd be shocked if there aren't studies on that, but um, I'm a reasonably smart person, but I'm smart enough to know that I'm not that smart. I would look at some of the academic studies on that. Um, I can make the case either way, but yeah, I, I don't want to, um, I'll stay in my lane here. Uh, I'm, I'm not a cognitive, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I, I think that I do a pretty good job of synthesizing research and presenting it in an interesting way, uh, but I'm not out there doing double blind studies or I'm no longer a college professor. Um, so I'm not doing that type of research, but I'd be curious to see what you find out. All right, cool. Just going down the list. Uh, we're at Michael now. Um, we have offshore team that work well for support. Thoughts on how remote hybrid works for new development initiatives? Oh, gosh. Um, so GitLab is doing some really interesting things uh, around that. Um, uh, let me... Before I answer that question, though, take a step back. Are, are we talking about hiring a firm to do it, or are we talking about sort of an internal development shop? Um, let's see. I guess we can give. Uh, I'll just speak uh, broadly. Uh, check out what GitLab does. Uh, Darren Murph right. is the head of. Oh, go ahead. All right. Um, I was just going to try to give Michael a chance to speak here, but you can keep going over. Uh, so um, I did a podcast with Darren Murphy. He's the head of remote at GitLab. And, and GitLab has been one of the um, companies at the forefront of remote and hybrid work. Fascinating to me. Um, they have extensive documentation in the thousands of pages. Everything is basically this wiki. And when they bring on other developers, it's kind of like Google in the sense that you just query stuff. You don't go to HR or you don't necessarily initiate a call, assume that everything's there and you still may have questions, but that's why they use a tool like Slack, which interestingly, and I don't necessarily agree with this, they archive all Slack messages after 30 days because they, they look at Slack as disposable. And eventually if it's important, they'll update sort of their master online wiki. Um, but th for that reason, the company has been extremely successful in Murph is, uh, I think his name is the uh, Oracle of Remote Work. 
uh, really smart dude. I know that he's written at least one book. And um, if you Google Darren Murph, Phil Simon, uh, he'll show up on my podcast. I was lucky enough to have him on. And uh, apropos of nothing, he actually blurbed um, my most recent two books. Cool. Michael, you, you are unmuted. Does that answer your question or did you? Uh, yes, it does. Say? Thank you. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right. Let's see. Going on to our next question here. Uh, let's see. I think we have less. Uh, so any collaboration tips for working with external organizations where the business relationship is challenging? Yeah, that's, that is a real challenging one. Um, I start off this book um, in that scenario. I changed the name so I wouldn't be sued, but I effectively had to sever a relationship as a provider because the folks would not agree to use the tools that we decided upon. I, I thought that we had a team level agreement, um, but they wouldn't use them. And you can read the story in the book, but even just setting up a basic meeting with people from three different organizations and three different time zones proved to be too taxing for me, given the work that I was contracted to do and the rate at which I was contracted to do it. So um, I mentioned before that company, Lemonly or, or something like that, don't quote me on that, um, that put the tools on the website. Um, look, if a firm is saying we can do these services and we use the tools that you like, but we cost six times as much, you may not decide to work with them. But I'd argue that if you had a, a firm that did use the tools that you like for collaboration and project management, and they were 10% more, and they were local to boot, ask yourself if a $100,000 project is really worth a 110,000 project, because you're just going to have fewer misunderstandings and less overall confusion. But you may want to walk away from some organizations because they won't use Slack, or they won't use email, I'm sorry, uh, Microsoft Teams, or whatever you're choosing as your hub or your project management tool. And this notion that they're in a different organization, we, we can't add them, bullshit. Um, Slack's got something called Slack Connect. It used to be shared channels. Microsoft's got the same thing. You absolutely can be part of the same team or workspace, even if you're part of a different organization. Whether their IT department allows it, however, is a different matter. But those are all things that I recommend in the book. You get out on the table from the beginning because the assumption that we'll all be able to collaborate well and use tools is insane. I've had people from, no joke, the same organization unable to communicate with each other because IT set different rules for different divisions. Um, you can see how that would be frustrating if it took us two hours to agree on a time to meet and now we were wasting 15 minutes because we couldn't do a screen share. So try to get those discussions out of the way early because you might decide if we can't even agree on the tools or the timing of the process, what are the odds that the actual work is gonna go well? I'd, I'd argue that's a pretty important data point to ignore. And while, while we're talking about time and everything right now, Phil. Uh, we have a few alumni in here asking questions uh, about different time zones. So are there like any best practices um, for uh, cooperation with team members in multiple time zones, especially if they're like international too? Yeah, as I mentioned before, core hours are certainly important. Now to be fair, if I'm in Arizona and someone's in China or India, that's going to be tough to land on that. But there are all sorts of um, pieces of um, all sorts of um, pieces of functionality and tools that people ignore. For example, in Slack, uh, one of my favorite fields uh, is um, time zone, right? And if you don't see that in your particular tool, odds are you can add some a custom field for location. Um, I know there are scheduling tools out there. I, I mentioned one that I use called Calendly. You can also use that not just for booking individual times, which Tyler's used, some of you I'm sure have heard of, but even with Calendly setting up uh, different um, options so people could vote on them. Long story short, if you're sending a bunch of messages back and forth, Google it. Um, there are lots of scheduling tools out there. I've had a few people on my podcast have mentioned some of them. But I think it starts with the recognition that people are going to be in different time zones. And if you want to work remotely and live anywhere, a company can allow for that. By the same token, I don't think that you can say, well, I only do Monday through Friday because you live in Mumbai, right? And we, and we live in Los Angeles. So someone's going to have to give. Technology aside, if you want to let employee to take advantage of that flexibility, they're going to need to be flexible. And occasionally, they might have to get up before 9 a.m. or take a call past 5 You're, you mean Sorry, I, was, I was still, yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, all right, so I, I know you mentioned a couple collaboration tools. I see we have a couple questions in here um, regarding collaboration tools. Can you maybe name a few more, or like what your favorites are? So for example, like project, calendar, messaging. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of Slack. Um, Microsoft Teams 
is basically stealing features from them. I was just watching a video on YouTube about how now uh, Slack about six, eight months ago launched Slack clips. So I can record asynchronous video and post it. So if it's a message for people, I don't have to schedule a meeting, right? I could just post it as a video. Um, Microsoft Teams just added that. So again, um, unless there's a compelling reason, odds are that one vendor will basically steal from what the other vendor is doing. Uh, I've become a big fan of Notion as a productivity tool, which you can also use for project management. It's really intuitive. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of saying this is the best collaboration or the best uh, project management tool because it is only as good as the people who use them. Conversely, if you're using Google Sheets to manage a project, sure, it's better than nothing. And depending on the project, that may be sufficient. But if you've got seven people in ten, to, I'm sorry, in four, four or five different time zones, um, you, you may decide that that Excel worksheet isn't really going to work if you're managing a complex project. My previous book, um, Reimagining Collaboration, goes much more into detail on the subject, and I will unabashedly plug it as a book that does not suck. All right, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, we'll we'll get to Gina. I think this might cover a lot with, what do you think is the main critical success factor in hybrid remote projects? Oh, whether or not they've read my book. I'm kidding, but um, if you made me pick one, I would just say people, but then there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, I, again, I, I'm not smart enough to say if you've got the right resources using the right tools with clarity. I mean, clarity is another good one, but even then you could be clear about building the wrong thing. You know, accountability, management, technology, following a process, gathering requirements. Um, I could keep going. Uh, it's just not that simple. This is why there are so many freaking books on project management. And I'm proud of the fact that my, my new one um, hopefully lets people frame things in an interesting way and, and frame their questions better. It's not just do this, do that. Um, these are these are really hard. There's a reason that so many of these projects fail. I think we do one more, right? I think we do one more. Um, we'll go, uh, John uh, was asking more about uh, pre-mortem. I think that's an interesting concept. Um, any more examples or resources um, to learn more about that? Yeah, in the book, I cite a 2015 article in Harvard Business Review because it's it's not my concept, but it was interesting when I did the research of the book, um, Tyler, I asked a lot of my friends, many of whom are software developers or consultants or college professors, if they've heard of um, pre-mortem. And everyone said, oh, you mean post-mortem, right? No, fun fact, the only person who said, oh yeah, we did them at Microsoft was my friend and fellow author, props to my man, Scott Birkin, occasional basketball teammate, Carnegie Mellon grad, and uh, he's written a bunch of books, one of which is about um, remote work. But um, it's not my idea. And it's remarkable to me how in so many years as an enterprise resource planning uh, consultant, we never asked the question. We, we had optimism bias baked in. So people may look at you weird, but I'd argue that, again, if it's a $5,000 project, does it make sense to spend two weeks on a pre-mortem? Probably not. But if it's a $32 million project and you don't do one, I'd argue that's absurd. All right, cool. And we'll wrap up. I think this will be our last question over here. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge moving forward? The tension between employers, particularly managers who are more comfortable, right, watching people work and employees, right? So there's this pendulum. And in the book, I write about how it swung considerably to the employees, right? Because uh, in chapter one of the book or two, I forget, um, I mentioned how in the United States, it's very pro-employer. Now, I don't want to make this all political. You can say that's good, that's bad. I'm just saying it is. Uh, my master's is in industrial labor relations. So compared to Canada or Europe, it's a very pro-employer environment. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out because will workers quit if they can't work remotely? Yes. Will they take less money if it means they can work remotely? Yes. But if I'm put on my manager hat for a minute, it's unreasonable for me to run a project or a company if I never see people. So I think it's going to be really interesting when you decouple work and wages with location. Zillow, about a year ago, I think, famously had said, we're going to pay people a set wage regardless of where they live. That flies in the, in the face of all uh, economic orthodoxy, right? Compensating wage differentials. If I live in Buffalo, I'm just going to make less, all things being equal, than if I live in Manhattan or Boston. So there are all sorts of things, but I, I think it's a fascinating subject and I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'll address it uh, in the future in one way or another, but um, 
yeah, I, I think that pendulum will keep moving back and forth, but I, I, I just don't see how we put the toothpaste back in the tube. We've had two years of working remotely. I think the question is all companies are going to be hybrid. The question is to how, to what extent? Is it one day a week, one day a month, one day a quarter, one day a year? I don't know. All right. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, that does conclude all of our time uh, for right now. Um, again, this is being recorded, so I will send up a follow-up email that will have the recording for this webinar. Um, it will have the link to Phil's website, so you can check out his book, you can check out his other works, uh, connect with you as well. I know a lot of you had unanswered questions, so um, if that's all right with, with, with you, Phil, um, if our alumni can just reach out to you. Uh, and then two, like I said, we will be go, uh, raffling off um, 10 copies of the book. Um, so whether your question was answered or not, I appreciate your participation. Uh, I'll let you know if you're one of the 10 alumni that are selected for that. Um, but that being said, stay tuned uh, to our follow-up email. And Phil, I don't know if you have anything else uh, you want to add before we sign off over here. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Phil. And uh, thank you everyone for attending today. This has been great. Thanks, Tyler. Cheers. Cheers.